Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I am your host, Zach Bitter. I have an exciting announcement to make. I am offering a chance to win a free 30-minute consultation with me. Entering is very simple. Just share an episode on any social media platform, tag me, or send a screenshot to hpopodcast at gmail.com. This is important because if you don't tag share with me, I may not see it and be able to enter you in the raffle. You can enter as many times as you want. There will be a winner announced during the show intro at the beginning of each month. I appreciate all the listeners who have participated in this so far. It really does go a long way in helping me grow the show when you share the episodes you like with your friends, family, and followers. Also, a new way to enter the raffle is to submit a show review on your favorite podcast platforms. November's winner is from Twitter or X. And the account is at dad underscore nobody. And he posted about episode 372, Havelina 100, reflecting on my buildup. All right, I will reach out to you and let you know how to set up your free consultation. Thanks for participating. All the ways to support the show is you can head to the show landing page, which is just zachbitter.com forward slash HPO. There you will be able to find access to the show Patreon page where you can actually access shows early and ad free by subscribing to the show on Patreon. You can also donate in other ways on that landing page, as well as access the full catalog of episodes, descriptions, show notes, and transcripts. If you're interested in diving into some of the previous episodes, I do want to give a quick shout out to my endurance training, simplified series of episodes. It's gotten quite long. So I listed them in the show notes. You can link to each one of those there, but If you're looking to start your endurance journey or just really fine tune it, I have a whole series of episodes that deal with just training principles in general and the different components that go into it between like easy running, speed work with short intervals, long intervals, long run development, the mental side of training, all sorts of different stuff. So check those out in the show notes if you're interested in refining your endurance training. If you'd like a little bit of extra support in your training, I'm actually launching a new coaching package. So this new one is actually a group training process that is online. What it is, is if you subscribe to it, you will get access to my full catalog of pre-made endurance plans, which range from 5K up to 100 mile, come in multiple levels in multiple different durations. And you have access to that as long as you're subscribed. So if you decide to train for a specific distance or event, All you got to do is let me know, and I send you the copy of that particular training program. But what comes with it is what is important, in my opinion, is when you're subscribed to this new coaching group coaching package, you will also be able to attend a weekly meeting with me and the other group members where we will cover topics that I find important for your endurance training journey, as well as questions and schedule adjustments that you have submitted beforehand and then also some live questions from the group. The group size is going to be limited to 30 though. So make sure you sign up soon because I will be starting this program before the end of 2023 to make sure people have access to this by the start of the new year. You can find information on that by just heading to my website at zachbitter.com or linking to it in the show notes. Supporting the show this year are my friends at Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. I have full descriptions about how I use both of these products in my training and racing at the end of the show. So if you're interested in checking that out, please stick around after this episode. For now, just some discounts and promotions from both of these products. Element Electrolytes is offering a free sample pack with your first purchase. Just go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. They have a no questions asked money back guarantee if you are unsatisfied. They also just released their warm beverage winter collection, which now includes raspberry chocolate. I just checked it out. It will be in my morning coffee protocol this winter. Delta G Ketone is the exogenous ketone company that has almost all of the research behind its formula. They are trusted by professionals around the world. You can get 20% off with code bitter to zero, just go to delta G ketones.com. There you can also sign up for a free consultation where they will help you understand how their product may fit best in your lifestyle. 
and then you can compare it to mine. Links to both of these products can be found in the show notes as well as the show sponsor landing page, which is zackbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Akshay, welcome to Austin. Thank you so well, much, man. Welcome back, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Yeah, you, so you, you lived in Austin for a while, right? I did. I lived in Austin from uh, when I was in high school. I moved, for, moved here when I was 13 from Singapore. In oh, India. okay. Did uh, uh, high school here and then left for my senior year and came back and did my undergrad in, in Southwestern, just North Austin. Oh, wow. Okay. So you actually really lived in Austin. Yeah, so for a bit. How long ago was that? Do you mind me uh, asking? I left Austin after... So I was, my time in the Marines was here too. My reserve unit was based here. And after college, I left after undergrad. So I was about 21, 22, something like that. Okay. Yeah. So long, en- a long time. L- long enough where it's a different city almost. Totally, completely <laughs> different. Coming here now, it's like a world of a different city. Yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine so. We've been in Austin now for, uh, I guess it'll be two years in January. So it's coming up gotcha. pretty quick on that. But uh, I mean, it's... It's, it was already hopping when we got here, obviously, yeah. but it's just kind of continually growing. And I guess they just recently, uh, there used to be this like building like regulation where you could only build so high south of, I forget which road. It might have even been south of the lake. Okay. And they just removed that, which was like kind of a big hurdle for development to occur beyond like malls, essentially, because like malls you. are going to be single story yeah, a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. And now that that's gone it opens it up for like apartment complexes and condominiums and things like that so now there's a bunch of developers who are looking at these abandoned malls that are now down kind of south of the city or south part of the city as like these great opportunities because you know as people keep coming into austin there that's what they're looking for yeah more housing and things like that so yeah it's a it's an interesting time to be here so yeah i've heard it austin (laughs) and even where i live phoenix is one of the fastest growing cities in the country from what i understand yeah Yeah, that's actually an interesting point because we were in phoenix that's where we moved from and when we left it was growing really fast and especially during the pandemic there was a scenario where our real estate agent told us that normally the greater phoenix area which is like you know like glendale mesa yeah, phoenix yeah. scottsdale all these places would have like thirty-five thousand houses on the market at any given time that was like average and during the pandemic it got on a 3500 so they were doing like, doing like it's, a 10 percent supply yeah which you know, as you can imagine the house prices went went, oh, it's cra- it was crazy. went up like crazy it so was crazy we were lucky. We bought in 2018, so we got in before that. Nice. Um, obviously, coming to Austin, we sunk it all right back into yeah, stuff here because yeah. it's a similar <laughs> situation here with uh, you know supply and demand with that. But follow, yeah. but yeah, you're you know you're back on the show now. I think this is the third time actually because you came on by yourself, and then I had you back on with uh, Dr. Nelson when we were kind of going over some nutritional stuff yeah, about yeah. your yeah your project, which is starting to form form itself in terms of actual dates and yes sir times yeah. and things like one, that one year from now i'll be actually either in antarctica or on my way to antarctica in chile to training for right so my whole world right now is training for it to attempt the first ever 110 day solo 1700 mile coast to coast ski crossing of antarctica so a crossing of antarctica coast to coast has been done with kites or dogs but it's never been done without that so pure man hauling like dragging a 400 pound sled for 12 plus hours a day across the entire continent is the goal Wow. And that's skis, right? Cross country skis. Yep. Is there a way to do it without skis? Or is that just like unheard? Uh, too, too long, I'm guessing, right? It's it part, of it, uh, part of the challenge. Like you, like some, you could try with snowshoes, but part of the challenge is if you're not on skis, especially when you're on the softer snow, you're just going to be plowing through. Mm. You know, there's that. But there are times where I'll actually be taking off the skis because when you deal with the, there's a, um, a phenomenon there called sastrugi, where it's kind of these windswept formations of snow that can be quite daunting as high as, I mean, as, as a human being sometimes, but mostly not that high, but even high enough that, and it's just kind of these little snow dunes, if you will, to navigate on skis. They're a nightmare. They're a mm. freaking nightmare to ski on. I've been to Antarctica before on an expedition and Sistrugi just sucks. Like there's no two ways about yeah. it. So often when I'm, if I'm dealing with significant portions of that, I will take off my skis to, to kind of just walk. It's even, it's just better. And what did too. you say those were called? Sistrugi. Okay. Is it's there a Russian a... word? Oh, okay. I forget what what exactly it means i know what like yeah i know the phenomenon what it looks like and i've dealt with skiing on uh-huh. it and it's not fun yeah <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah those are and i will inevitably deal with that it's uh nature of the beast in antarctica one of many challenges yeah. out there <laughs> so you're you're targeting 110 days which gives us kind of like a duration to wrap our minds around what's the actual distance 1700 miles Seven, 1700 miles and do you know is there because i'm imagining this isn't just a flat Snowfield? It is not. Uh, one would kind of think, even I thought when I first got into this world, but the South Pole is actually at 9,000 
9,500 feet. So you're going uh, uphill. Like I'll start on a place called the Filchner Ice Shelf, which is pure flat, then going up a glacier called the Support Force. So you're going uphill and then kind of gradually uphill towards the South Pole and then gradually downhill on the other side, down uh, the glacier called the Reedy, back onto the Ice Shelf, the Ross Ice Shelf on the other side. But even the downhill, it's not downhill where you can kind of, you know, get gravity right. and ski down. You're still having to work for every step with your sled. <laughs> Is yeah. it relatively easier than going on the ups, though? For sure. It's definitely at that point, because at the South Pole, I'll be, you know, at distance-wise, the halfway mark. I seriously doubt, in terms of days, I will make it there on the halfway mark, because obviously your sled's heavier, mm -hmm. you're going uphill. So um, I think it'll be, I'm hoping, around day 60 at the latest. So then I have another 50, yeah, another 50 days to, to make it back down. But ideally, I mean, if I can somehow something awesome happens and i'm at the south pole on day 55 that'll be magical yeah you know <laughs> so yeah you probably yeah. just know you're gonna get there ahead of time if that happens right that yeah then i mean if if that happens then i'll be in, in, in i'll be feeling on top of the world because now your sled's half the weight mm. and you're going slightly downhill you're there's that obviously there is kind of the cumulative fatigue because doing 100 days 110 days is not twice as hard as 55 days right. it's exponentially harder right because you got the cumulative fatigue build up of just the workload you're putting out there. Not to mention, I will be calorically deprived from the get-go. Because mm -hmm. I will be eating, on the first five days, I'll be eating about 4,500 calories, five, day six through 10, 55, and then 6,100 calories, and then working my way up to 6,600 calories. Because initially, when you get out there, your body just can't consume 6,600 calories. So you start a little lighter, just to get your body used to putting in so much food. Uh, and then I work up, but even at 6,600 calories, I'll be at a deficit because I'll be burning like eight to 10,000 a day, mm -hmm. which is why, as we were talking the other day, right, that I'm kind of, I'm training for fat. Yeah, yeah I'm, <laughs> I have to get fat. It's a really weird thing training for polar travel because you need to train endurance, you need to train strength, and you need to do it all while you're fat. Mm -hmm. And none of those things go together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because like, yeah, you just can't roll up there in your peak fitness state and expect to come back or to get to the finish line in or, or even get there you might just end up like failing at that point because you'd be what, what what do you normally weigh when you're just kind of in the middle of like a typical endurance training feat when i was in peak ultra running shape because there was a long time ultra running was my main kind of thing that mm -hmm. i was i was doing nothing at your level but uh but the that was my jam and at that point i was 135 pounds okay. 130 130 so i was skinny right super yeah. obviously like ultra running shape now i'm 170 so a lot more muscle as well as fat definitely just bulked up a lot too uh and my goal i'll, I'll get because i'm going to minnesota this winter for our training expedition is to get to 175 before i get on the ice in minnesota but and then I'll lose at least 20, 30 pounds out there and then I have to bulk up again. Yeah. <laughs> and my goal is to get to 180 before Antarctica because I think I'll lose at the minimum 40 pounds. OK, so when you get done, you're going to be back to that endurance ultra marathon. Yeah. 135, 140 pound yeah. uh, version of yourself, exactly. which is going to be really interesting. You know, I've, I've talked to a bunch of different kind of long haulers. Yeah. Mostly like transcontinental type stuff. Yeah. And one thing that I got curious about early on was I was asking him about that, like what was their approach in terms of weight maintenance or, you know, what was their target? Did they go in with more? Running's a little more goofy, I think, because there's an impact. Of course. Versus skiing, yeah. you're, you have the advantage you know. of it being a little lower impact, yeah. I think. So yeah. you, I mean, like I can imagine like if I put on 40 pounds and started running, the problems could occur. Exactly. Yeah. Due to the impact. So that's not as much of an option for them. I mean, maybe five, 10 pounds or so would probably be appropriate. Uh, but yeah, so I was just, I was curious about kind of how the body would respond with one approach versus the other. And it seemed to me, especially when I talked to someone who's done multiple, yeah. they would say with the better they were able to maintain, the quicker their turnaround after was by mm -hmm. a pretty large margin. So even if they went sense, in a little yeah. heavy and lost like say 20 pounds over the course, yeah. They, it took them so much longer to return to normalcy after the trip versus, uh, like, I think one of the examples was the person they, they finished the transcon was only like two pounds lighter. So it was like, wow, that's, you know, could have just been water yeah, weight. Exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's a pretty wild, like level of maintenance. Yeah. And they had done it, uh, you know, this might've actually been Dean Carnassus. Oh, okay. Cause I think he did, I want to say this was him. Uh, but he said he, cause he's done it twice. He hasn't done it three times, but he did it. He did it once where he just kind of like showed up with his normal state and just kind of tried to eat as much as he could kind of mm -hmm. what you would imagine. Mm -hmm. 
And then the next time I think he did it, he intentionally gained weight. I think it was like 10 pounds or something okay. like that. And he was able to kind of finish at his normal, like kind of comfortable training mm -hmm. weight. Mm -hmm. So he shed the extra weight that he had put on, but he didn't lose much beyond what he would normally kind of like prefer to be at when he's just going about his day to day. Got you. And he said, I think after that one, he bounced back a lot quicker. Mm, okay. I think that was Dean. I've had okay. a lot of different long haulers well, on. I now. got you. <laughs> uh, I asked yeah. uh, Christian Morgan. He's been on a couple of times. He's done like a lot of Appalachian Trail stuff. Okay. And he he just recently broke the southbound record on the Appalachian Trail. And he was telling me, I think, too, about just kind of the variance between some of the different guys have done it. Because mm. uh, I think I think Scott Jerk might have lost a lot of weight during it. And he seemed mm -hmm. to have a little bit of a harder time post Okay. Post effort versus Carl Meltzer, who I think lost very little, and he mm. seemed to bounce back a little quicker. Quickly. Okay. Which, who knows? I mean, we're, it's a little bit of a, there's a lot of confounders probably to consider there, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's it's interesting thought process. So yeah. it'll be fun fun to hear kind of how you feel after, because there's really no way around losing Out that there, much no, weight. For sure. Yeah, just due yeah. to the logistics, because how big is your sled? Because so it'll be two sleds back that I'm carrying with four, about, I'm estimating around 400 pounds, at the most 200 kilos, which is 440 pounds. But obviously, the lighter the, po the lighter, the better. I mean, it is ruthless with weight cutting. Like even measuring my food, which, by the way, you were very helpful for and coming up. So thank you for all your support along the way as well. But coming up with a food plan to get as many calories as possible to be as light as possible while also getting hitting my macronutrient numbers, right? Because you're, again, you're putting in so much work. But unlike like and like you said, in with uh, with the running, the transcontinental run, it's a lot more impact, a lot harder. But you have support teams over there, like low impact for me, but I'm carrying all my own food. So that's like the, you know, the pros and cons kind mm -hmm. of thing of each challenge. So I can't just as much as I'd like to, can't eat as much, but, uh, uh, but I'll be dragging all my own food, my fuel, because I'll be boiling snow for, for water and my own tent. And I mean, everything cutting weight. Like I've cut the tags off clothes. I'm not taking any. I'll be wearing the same clothes for the whole 110 days. <laughs> at least to say I'll be pretty stinky at the end yeah. of it. Uh, <laughs> but even like... I cut my toothbrush in half. I've cut the zips, the zip handles off my tent to save more weight. And I tie a string because you have to you have strings on all zips because you're using mittens with them, right? So tie the string directly to the zip, cut the zip handle off, saved like another 35, 40 grams. So as much as possible, just ruthlessly weight cutting to make it as efficient as possible. Not only does that have the physical element of just being a lighter sled, psychologically it helps because now you know you've done everything possible to be ruthless with weight cutting including mm -hmm. my food to be as weight efficient as possible like on previous expeditions for example i used to eat some things like uh, cheese and salami for example and i didn't know this at the time because on previous expeditions i didn't have to be as ruthless with weight cutting it was a shorter trip heavier sled not the end of the world this trip is so big never been done before for a reason that i'm a lot more ruthless with my details of, of weight cutting so i would realize that cheese for example might have 10 grams worth of fat uh, fat, proteins, and carbs, let's just say, just a number. But for that 10 grams of macro, macro weight, it might be a serving of 18 grams. Mm. So that's highly weight inefficient, right? So I looked at foods that only had a 90% or better ratio of macro weight to actual weight. That way I'm just being as weight efficient with my food as possible. And to find all that, to, to nail down the exact grams of food, it was a good amount of work to get that to be even 6,600 calories. I've got it to weigh 1.1 kilos. Mm -hmm. which is very weight efficient by polar standards. And that's your daily intake is the 1.1? 1. 1 yeah, so one, one, uh, at 66, it'll be 1.1. 1. 1. So yeah, so but like when I'm at 61, because I'm taking a calculated risk of from day 11 to 50, I'll be at 6,100 calories mm -hmm. just to reduce a little bit more weight uh, on the sled. It'll save me another about five pounds by doing that. Uh, which again, it's kind of a risk because even at 66, you're still at a deficit. Yeah. But the sled is just nightmarishly heavy when you're, uh, you know, when you're, when it's yeah. that, that big. So and you're hauling the extra body weight at that point too. So it's, you sort of have this mobile aid station on you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's a big reason why now in my training, I don't actually run at all for my endurance work mm -hmm. because to their point, like I'm carrying around just so much more fat even and yeah. so much more muscle that the injury, you're so much more injury prone. Like I've noticeably noticeably feel it's a lot harder to move so my endurance work purely comes from tire dragging and hiking mm -hmm. just because they that's also more kind of applicable to what i'm doing you mm -hmm. know so i've stopped running completely and i only get all my cardio work through that yeah so tell us a little about the the little or the, or the sled setup what does that look like in terms of like your training do you have like a so you're pulling a tire yeah what else goes into that 
in the tire nothing so when i'm I, I live in phoenix right and so to it's a really comical sight i have this giant truck tire that i just go dragging around parks for sometimes hours on end like a couple of weeks ago was my 39th birthday to so, so to celebrate it at a 39 hour endurance week with three back-to-back nine-hour endurance days. So two of them were nine hours of tire dragging and then a nine-hour hike. Mm -hmm. And nine hours of tire dragging is mind-numbing because you're moving so freaking slow, you know, and you're just moving painfully slow around this little park. Mm -hmm. So that's the core element. But now I'm going to Minnesota this winter to replicate the Antarctic conditions as much as possible where I'll be dragging a sled. So that'll be just a very heavy sled. I'll load it up with tons of weight to try to get to 400 pounds. Not the same sled I'll be using in Antarctica because those two sleds are custom made and I, I have them with me, but I'm, I want them fresh and unscratched, you know, mm -hmm. for, uh, for Antarctica. But it'll be just a very heavy sled that I'll be dragging for 35 days. I'm staying with my fiance at an Airbnb, just going out every day and then 35 days going out solo on an expedition like a mini Antarctica, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that'll be kind of loading it up with food, my tent, my fuel, stoves, everything that I'll be using in Antarctica. Yeah, a total dress rehearsal. Exactly. So you're gaining a ton of weight now in preparation for this dry dress rehearsal, essentially. Yes, yes. That's going to take a huge chunk of that weight off of you, exactly. I would imagine. Yeah. So then what's the game plan after you finish the dress rehearsal? Once I come back, start immediately start bulking back up. It's yeah. it's none of this is great for the body, right? No, uh -uh. <laughs> but it, the way I see it is great for the mind and spirit. So, uh, but that's like I mean, right now even to bulk up, I mean I'm eating. I'm other than being gluten free, I'm eating kind of everything. Mm -hmm. But right before I go on expedition, I move to a keto style diet, and I'll actually primarily like right now I'm for example sleeting carbs. It's just a great way to just get fat. But I move to a keto style because when I'm on ice. 73% of my diet is on fats because fats is nine calories per gram and proteins and carbs are four. So it's more weight efficient to have a heavy, higher fat ratio, right? But to, so to get my body acclimated and used to using fat as the primary source of energy, I moved to keto a little bit before expedition. So once I come back, I'll just carb load, just eat a shit ton, start bulking back up and then alternate between keto. Cause my goal is not to be in ketosis. I'm not trying to lose weight. Mm -hmm. I just want to get my body fat adapted, not carb adapted as the primary source of energy. Yeah, once you get out there, your body's going to be burning a tremendous amount of fat exactly. off of you and as well as what you're eating. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, it'd be really cool if they could like hook you up to some sort of biometric yeah. thing that could like analyze everything that's going on while yeah. you're out there between just like the feedback your body's giving and the the just the ratios of carbs to fat that you're burning along the way and stuff like For that. For sure, yeah, it will be interesting to know. Yeah, so you have it. Do you have percentages of like fats, carbs, and proteins kind of figured out that you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis while I, you're out there? I do. I'll be taking 300 grams fat, 150 grams protein, and the fat is the only one that'll vary depending on my calorie, but mm -hmm. at 6,600 calories, it'll be about 550 grams fat. Oh, okay. Interesting. And how much yeah. carbs are you getting then? 300. 300. Yeah. So it's, it's so funny because the numbers are so high, 300 grams of carbs still fits within like a, a ketogenic ratio, essentially. That, because yeah, exactly. The <laughs> because the numbers are so high. Yeah. So even at those numbers, it's like 70, I think 70 to 73% uh, calories come from fat. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a topic that I, I talk about from time to time because a lot of people who are interested in what I'm doing are interested in what I'm doing somewhat because of the dietary stuff. Yeah. That's different enough. Unique. Exactly. Yeah. From what they typically think of an endurance athlete would be doing. So eventually they get around to asking me the, the common question of, well, what are you eating? What are your macronutrient ratios yeah. and things like that? And it's like, I always feel compelled to share what I'm doing in training alongside any description I give, because mm. first of all, it changes. Like if I'm off season, the grams, the gram totals in every one of them will look different. Yeah. But you know, you introduce a 20 hour training week and then all of a sudden like, yeah, I might have a day where I'm eating quite a bit more carbohydrates than what a person on a ketogenic diet would mm -hmm. do. But if you would test my blood ketone levels, there's a good chance I'm going to be like well into a ketogenic, like a therapeutic Got range you. of uh, blood ketone levels. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, we have like this dietary approach that has sort of like, I guess, multiple ways of being defined, you know, that yeah. people kind of gravitate towards the, the Finney Volick kind of criteria of like 50 grams or less. Which for most people, that's probably a good kind of target if yeah. you're just going about your life, not training for anything specifically. Yeah. 50 grams is probably what it would take. You introduce, you know, training for a 100 mile race, that number shifts. It's a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you put yeah. in so much work. Yeah, yeah it's totally. so, it, it, is, it is funny to think about. Um, 
Yeah. So what are you eating? Like how many calories a day are you eating right now just to gain the weight? Right now, you know, my, um, I'm still at a point, especially with traveling, just like eat anything kind of uh-huh. thing. Uh, but once I go back, because I'm about what, six weeks away from Minnesota heading out, uh, I'm going to, once I get back from this trip to Austin, move, uh, move to start moving to keto. Mm-hmm. And I haven't like currently been measuring calories. It's more just eat everything and just measuring my weight, weight to make yeah. sure it's not losing. But once I go to keto part, a big part of it will be just drinking straight oil. Mm-hmm. Cause again, you have to eat so many calories. Cause not only do I need to maintain not, or not lose, I got to keep putting on mm-hmm. and putting in that many hours of training while trying to put on is it's work. You know, you're eating yeah. like an animal. So uh, part of it is just drinking straight oil. To one, get my body used to that because I'll be doing that on on the expedition as well. As part of it is we'll be just drinking oil is just straight calories, right? Mm-hmm. But obviously you can't eat drink too much of that. That's not really good for digestion, right. to say the least. So I do do a little bit of that because again, when you're trying to eat so much fats, oil is the only thing that's pure fat. So there's no carbs or proteins in it, mm-hmm. you know. So part of that I've gotten used to at one point, like drinking like 50 grams of oil a day, just mix it with some water or in a protein shake or yeah. whatever, and just down a ton of oil. There's different ways yeah. to do it. I remember when I, when I was teaching, actually, I had like a jar of olive oil, like in this mm. cupboard by, by my desk yeah. that I would just like, when I was on like a big training block and it was like, I mean, you get busy when you're working a full-time totally. job and it's like yeah. easy to like not eat enough and then realize yeah. you, you, the hard part is like you get to the end of the day, you've done a couple of workouts and you're like, dang, I'm only like halfway to my calorie goals for the day. Mm -hmm. And now I have to eat this like uncomfortable amount of food. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like you do all these weird little things to try to make sure you don't get yourself in that situation in the first place. Yeah. (laughs) So like when I was kind of when since I was low carb, I wasn't I was going to, you know, try to do like oils, like you said, something that's pure fat in a lot of cases. Exactly. (laughs) And I remember one day. So I would I would just take pulls from it. Like sometimes like in between classes, like it wouldn't be much. So it wasn't like kind of all that disgusting like yeah, it would be if yeah. i tried to actually like physically swing. exactly drink a glass of it <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> and so it's just almost just like a, a, a palate cleanser type amount of oil yeah um and like and i remember what one point i remember thinking is like you know this olive oil bottle sort of looks like a bottle of wine i'm better like make it known what i'm doing here <laughs> exactly people are like dude just getting <laughs> get drunk in the middle of class in trouble <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, so it's it's interesting stuff but you yeah what you got to do yeah yeah because there's two there's kind of two components to that there's the you want to start the event with sort of a dietary approach you're familiar with just so that like you said like you have like the the fat oxidation rates mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that may be imp- impacted by the duration in which you're doing it so kind of going in cold turkey may not be good yeah. for that but then it's just the digestibility. So there's probably like a digestibility threshold in general with certain things like oils that probably ranges from one person to the next. Yeah. But then there's also going to be like an adaptation, I would imagine, where like in the beginning, your threshold is this. But if you're doing it for six weeks, that exactly. threshold may increase and get closer to what you're or hopefully to what you're going to actually be doing. For out there. sure. Yeah. I mean, I was at a point and I'd kind of stopped a little bit now. Life's been a little crazy moving around, but drinking like 50, 60 grams of oil a day, you know, mm-hmm. and no issues digestion wise. I also moved initially when I first started doing it, I drank like 50 grams of MCT oil. Mm-hmm. MCT oil was dis- disastrous <laughs> on my digestion. That was not a good day. Uh, <laughs> so I moved to avocado oil. It's a great way to lose weight, easy. maybe. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I moved to avocado oil. Uh, so you live and learn through making some mistakes yeah. as you go through this process. But yeah, I moved to avocado oil and and now even like, I mean, I could easily, I'm sure drink 20, 30, no issues and just kind of increase mm-hmm. a little bit from there. It's yeah. kind of a bummer because MCT oil would be probably the best option if it could, if you could handle it. I do have a little bit in the, one of my buddies is a supplement formula designer. So he made a custom made supplement for me mm-hmm. for Antarctica because my diet isn't exactly healthy out there. Right. right yeah. So <laughs> he, his supplement gives me all the micronutrients, the vitamins. It does have some MCT oils in there as well. So I'm getting a little bit through that source. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I forget what else. I mean, it's a beast of a supplement. It's got like shilajit and like this, that, and the other thing. It's an absurd uh, amount of ingredients he's concocted together in yeah. this mix. I would imagine like explorations and long duration things like this where you're self-supporting has gotten a bit of a technological advantage for just sure. in food chemistry. For sure. Now you can just dehydrate stuff. You can get like you, you in the past, you'd probably come back with all sorts of deficiencies. Yeah. Now you I mean, kind of back, be on top of that. Yeah. Actually. Way back when they used to get what scurvy and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Right. Thankfully we don't have that issue anymore. <laughs> Definitely a lot more knowledge since then. Yeah. Uh, so, and yeah, I'm, I'm blessed with good, a good team who makes this possible. You know, my buddies created like an insane supplement and all the help I've gotten even coming up with a nutritional plan. Um, which has been invaluable. And I put it to the test on previous expeditions as well. Mm-hmm. And now I'll be uh, refining it further and further on uh, as I go to Minnesota. 
you know, a lot of things like even even like when I'm skiing, I've, I've changed a little bit of my lunch diet. So I'll be skiing for the first shift for 90 minutes, take a quick break for water, peeing, food, and then eight shifts of 75 minutes is kind of the goal. So after the fourth shift, I have a slightly different meal because while I'm skiing, my, my on-the-go food is macadamia nuts and chocolates. Mm-hmm. So at the, after the fourth break, I'll have a tiny bit of jalapeno chips and a different kind of chocolate because psychologically that also gives you something smaller to look forward to, right? You have a break to have to, have to think about lunch, not think about the end of the day. I mean, as much as possible, keeping your mind present, staying in the now, but as you well know, your mind's going to wander yeah. <laughs> and it's going to think about what's next. So if you break it up into these mini chunks, you have, it makes it psychologically easier. So that was a learning from, uh, I was in the Arctic earlier this winter doing a couple of solo expeditions up there as training. And it was like, all right, I need something else to break the length of this day just to make it psychologically easier. So mm-hmm. just switch the variety of chocolate and jalapeno chips, a very small amount for my lunch, because most of that I'll eat when I first come into the tent. That is heavenly Mm -hmm. that's my morale food is at the after i after i finish the day of skiing i set up my tent i go in there and while the snow is boiling for water which takes a little bit of time the first thing i eat is jalapeno chips and it's divine Mm -hmm. divine (laughs) yeah the mental side is really really interesting to me and i've always been working i've got like a continuous goal of refining how to describe the mental approach of Mm. these longer effort i mean i'm working mostly single day ultra marathon stuff but it's a similar idea Of of like scaffolding your goals and things like that so one way i've been trying to describe it to people now most recently is like if you think of like your mind your mind is kind of like a magnet where it is going to get attracted to whatever kind of target or goal that you set out for it yeah so the easy part is the end goal that sort of presents itself and that's usually the draw in the first place so that's good to have that like attention and that draw towards that because it's going to draw motor you're gonna draw motivation from that and things like that But it's almost too far off. So whether you're looking at it, yeah, whether you're looking at it from the lens of I'm going to do this big training program to get ready for this 100 mile race or you're actually on the starting line of the 100 mile race and you're going to go through the paces of getting from start to finish. You you expend way more mental energy, in my opinion, when you have that goal too far out. So it's like that attraction, that duration of the attraction actually like physically drains more mental energy than if your mind can kind of attach itself to something a little closer. 100%, yeah. So you kind of got to build in this scaffolding of these different things that your mind is going to get sucked into and think about that will supersede what you want to get to, but it's too early to start thinking about it. Absolutely. And I always find that to be like the more of those you can build in, the better it's going to be from a mental energy standpoint. But... I'm still, again, talking about single day stuff. Gr- granted, I guess the training, you could get to durations as long as what you're talking about here. But that's also got a lot of like kind of intuitive built in things where like you finish a workout, you're done till the next day. Yeah. Whereas yeah. you finish a day and you kind of are just doing more work and then basically sleeping, getting and doing it all over and again. And doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. That's the challenge and part of the draw for polar travel because polar travel, there's a polar explorer from the 1900s and the kind of the OG days of uh, polar exploration who said polar exploration is at once the cleanest and most isolated way of having a bad time, which has been devised. <laughs> and I couldn't agree with more because, you know, unlike it often got com- gets compared to mountain climbing, like Everest or something like that. It's not nearly as dangerous as Alex Honnold's free solo Mm -hmm. or the alpinist, right? Free soloing up ice or even mountaineering, but it's far more suffering. Part of that is, you know, when I, and I've done a lot of mountaineering as well, as you go up and down the mountain, it's more dynamic. The terrain is different. The days are different. The views are different. And often the environment forces you into flow. Like I was on Denali uh, early last year. Uh, it's the tallest mountain in North America. And, you know, there's a 16 ridge at 16,000 feet where it's so, such a thin ridge line. One foot is front of the other, in front of the other. And you got like a thousand foot drop mm. on each side. When you're in that, your mind forces you into flow. The environment forces you into flow. You're not thinking about stuff. You're not looking at the views because you're thinking about the one step in front of you. Yeah. Right. You have to. Mm-hmm. So that's beautiful but in antarctica you don't have that because it's just flat white nothingness every day barring a few sections of antarctica where there's mountain range every day is flat white nothingness and you're doing the same damn thing (laughs) over and over and over again 
that monotony is mind numbing. And that's to me is I'm more drawn from the suffering, the struggle, the endurance aspect rather than the danger aspect. So it's not nearly as dangerous as some of that mountaineering stuff, but it's a lot more mental and physical suffering repeatedly. And that to me, it's not the suffering in and of itself that I seek. It's what that suffering gives you access to. As you well know, right? Running ultra, as you enter the pain cave, you struggle, you mm -hmm. suffer, but it gives you access to that transcendence. And that is the draw. But because it's so monotonous, to your point earlier, you have to break it down into those. Like I'm not entering Antarctica thinking about day 110, mm -hmm. right? So you multiple different ways to do that. One element is the latitude markers. As I move from 87 to 88 to 89 to 90 degrees, the South Pole, another one is every 10 days I'll eat a dessert. So I'll have a different meal. That also adds just a morale element, but now you have a thing to look forward to. And outside of that 10 days, my fiance is going to write me a letter for every 10 days that just kind of, a, a, it's something really to look forward to to open, you know? So I'll have sort of five days will be the letter. The next five days will be the, uh, the dessert, then five days, the letter. So you have constantly these little things to keep you motivated and keep you going throughout. And then even in the middle of the day, as I mentioned, the lunches, and even that first shift is 90 minutes. And then the next ones are 75. So once that first shift is done, it's kind of like in my mind, the first shift no longer counts. It's, it's like a nothing shift. Mm -hmm. Now you only have four shifts till you got to hit lunch, you know, it's so all these little things to keep breaking it down. And even just one shift is 75 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's your whole world. Your whole world is that shift. Mm -hmm. I just got to go there. And, and the, 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 the burden as well as the beauty of, of polar travel is during those shifts, your mind wanders because as I said, it's flat white nothingness, right? So you can, you're, sometimes your mind, if you're not, if the, if you don't have mastery over it, it can make five minutes feel like a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I've had moments on polar trips where I look at my watch thinking like we're almost end with the shift and it'll be like 10 minutes in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, God damn it. This is terrible. You know? So mastery of our mind is, is the draw and that's everything like training for that, you know? Yeah. Getting ready for Antarctica is the mind mastery as well. It's an interesting topic because I think with my coaching clients, one thing I'll try to do is I'll try to separate as much as you can. There's an obviously a exchange here between the physical and the mental, Yeah. but I'll try to describe in two different ways to give them kind of like focal points so that mm. they can actually like com so they can actually comprehend that they're what they're doing mm -hmm. and then actively do it and acknowledge they're doing it so that they feel prepared. Mm. So like one of it is just you get to the start of this race, this hundred mile race, and it gets to be this point where you get closer and closer to you start getting nervous, anxiety and everything that goes into like, yeah. I've got to run hundred miles. And yeah. it, so it's like, how do you rationalize that? Well, you make it smaller. And how do you make it smaller? You look at everything you did to prepare for it. So yeah. what I'll tell a lot of my coaching clients is think of it this way. Like by the time you step on that starting line, you've done 99% of this project. The hundred mile race itself is really just a consolidation of like a week or two of training mm -hmm. into one day. And it's really just that last 1% of mm -hmm. everything you've done so far. And if you want to extrapolate even further and just think like, how long have you been running? Well, 10 years. So, well, you've mm -hmm. technically been preparing for this for 10 years then yeah. don't, don't discount the, the steps that. that built you up to the training plan you currently did. I love that. That one, I think people have an easier time wrapping their head around. The next one is like, how do they actually think about like the, the process of mental in terms of acknowledging things that they've done that have prepared them? Because I think most people are mentally ready. They just don't know it. Mm. And if they don't know it, they can't access the mm -hmm. tools available mm. to actually get through it. Mm. So the way I tell it to people with this one is like, Think about anything you do in life. Like if, if, any, if you have a job, you're doing this just intuitively where yeah. it's like you go into work, maybe your boss gives you a project. That yeah. project is going to take you two weeks to do. So you start scaffolding what you need to do each day at work yeah. to take the steps required to get there. So once you kind of have that scaffolding laid out, you stop thinking about the end of the project as your, your constant. Yeah. I mean, it's there, it's in the back of your mind, but it's not something that you're burning a lot of mental energy on. You're Absolutely. worried about Monday from 10 until noon, I Absolutely. need to finish this aspect of it. And I can't even worry about the next step until I finish this aspect. Yeah. So I think really just like knowing or acknowledging that in your day-to-day -day life, you're likely doing these things. Yeah. And it's just a matter of don't mindlessly go through that process, acknowledge that process so you can actually get the gratification of what you're actually doing mentally and then place that over the approach that you described in terms of 
kind of adding it to the physical element of doing ultra marathons or in your case, Arctic exploration. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And the mental aspect is, I mean, of course there is a physical aspect, but it's mostly is the, is that, as you know from ultra running, but especially out there when you're completely alone, you know, navigating that solitude. Mm -hmm. So I've learned over time, like some of the core virtues that guide me is presence, being able to master presence and staying in the now. And a very simple way to do that is bring your world back into your five senses. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of my many mantras I also use is make your world small, kind of like what you echoed, right? Uh, so making your world small, bring it back to the five senses. And then courage, because every day, courage is the, I mean, Maya Angelou says, courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Mm -hmm. You can practice it erratically, but not consistently. So courage every day, I mean, stepping out on that battlefield every day, it's work, especially when you're being hammered by hurricane force winds, right? Brutal winds, minus 40 degrees, some of the most savage environments on earth, you know, uh, out there. And then in curiosity, always having an openness to see what, was, what will be out there. Like being out there alone, the depths of solitude, the depths of suffering. I get to open doors into the human soul that are very rarely opened, mm -hmm. you know, and that's part of the draw. And so a curiosity to see what will, what will be in that, you know, on the other side of those doors. Like you have to battle the dragon to find the treasure and the bigger the dragon, the dragon out there is going to be a big one. Mm -hmm. So the treasures I get to unearth are huge in curiosity. I mean, people have asked me, you know, what next, who will you be after this? And I said, I don't know. Yeah. And that's part of the excitement. And then having a sense of humor is an absolute must. You have to be able to laugh at yourself, laugh at things because things get hard out there. You know, out there, the volume of life is dialed. Everything is, you know, has amplified it at a high intensity. So the highs are so high, but the lows are so extremely low. And it becomes this kind of microcosm to experience the entire human condition in one kind of condensed period of time, which is part of the draw. But those four virtues I've found are not only valuable in, on this, but just in life to navigate the challenges of life. You do that. And of course, there's many other virtues, but I found, I found that kind of those four are someone's that trump the others and a lot of others will spring from them mm -hmm. they've been invaluable in guiding me through all the things i've done even to prepare for what's coming yeah and i and we've talked about some of the stuff you've done in the past on prior episodes but for listeners who are maybe just going to listen yeah. to this one this isn't something that you just decided to do on a whim <laughs> and <laughs> which is all. probably good <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so you you said something that i mean we chatted about this a little bit yesterday too but uh the way i think about just life in general now that I'm older than I once was, I guess yeah. is the way to say it is there's certain like you, you hit certain like benchmarks in life yeah. where you sort of have like a big change or something is different to the degree where like you feel like you've almost entered a different life or a different phase of your life at yeah. least. And then you look back at yourself during those previous stages and it's almost a different person to some yeah. degree. And the further yeah. back you go, usually the less connected you maybe are to that person or the yeah. more separate that person is from your current self. Yeah. Generally, those take a lot of time to go from one to the next, I think. You, you, you know, you have like some ones that are kind of built into society maybe where like, you know, high school versus college, yeah. your first real job out of college, yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but the way you've kind of gone about just endurance in ultra marathon, if we want to call it that, is, is putting kind of a position probably to, like you said, in a relatively compressed period of time come out the other end, not recognizing the person who went in. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What's that like given the different experiences you've had? It's, you know, to a certain degree, life threw them my way. I mean, before, when I first moved here, you know, as I mentioned, I moved from India to Singapore, got very heavily into drugs, lost two friends to addiction, still have all these scars in my arm from cutting myself. This was a cigar burn, very self-destructive, lost mm -hmm. two friends, got out of that, watched the movie Black Hawk Down. You've seen that one? Yeah. Uh -huh. That movie changed my life. It got me out of drugs and into the military, into really? the Marines. Okay. So that's it why is, you joined. That's why oh, I joined, because wow. watching that movie, specifically that scene where Gary Gordon and Randy Sugar, these two Delta snipers, they volunteered to go on the ground to set up a defensive perimeter to protect the second Black Hawk that had crashed. They knew that they had no idea when reinforcements would arrive, and they knew that hundreds, if not thousands, of armed enemy personnel were heading their way. And they still volunteered to go down. They both died, but the guy they died protecting, Michael Durant, is still alive today because of what they did. Mm -hmm. 
and that courage, man, that, that it's awe-inspiring, you know? So it made me question this very selfish, worthless existence I was living and almost overnight stopped doing drugs, joined the Marines. So that was the, the Marines birthed the very essence of who I am today, the desire to seek out struggle, mm -hmm. to seek out adversity, because Marine Corps training was hard. You mm -hmm. suffered. And that was beautiful, right? It taught me the ability in the human spirit to transcend suffering, to go with, to war with the self and win, and to do it in service of something greater. In the Marines, nobody gave a shit about your well-being. What mattered was the men and the mission. And separate from all the politics of the war, and like lot obviously was wrong and all that, but on the ground, even in Iraq, we were there to help. We wanted to do some good. We were serving, helping the people there. We were fighting for each other, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and even at the cost of your own well-being, there was a lot of times we didn't want to go on missions. You go when you're told to, you know, which many times it sucked in the moment, but it was beautiful. So the Marines birthed that. And that's when I, that like, that was one evolution of the self. One, you know, there was a death of one version of me, even now coming into Austin, because this is where I had my whole drug phase. And I was looking at my life. And as I was driving in here with my fiance and I, I told her, like, I can't even fathom that version of me. I can't even imagine this version of me looking back, the things I used to do and the draw of that, even going to frat parties in college, the amount I used to drink back then, you know? I can't even wrap my hand around that version of me. Yeah. Because I struggled a lot even after the Iraq. Like, at, Marines got me into outdoor sports, but then after Iraq, I was deployed to Iraq in 07 as an infantry Marine, and when I came back, I really struggled with alcohol. With, I was diagnosed with PTSD, depression, lost a couple of junior Marines to suicide, lost a close buddy of mine in the war, and struggled a lot. I mean, I was at a point, man, drinking like a bottle of vodka a day. I would drink for five days straight, throw up, drink again, you know, and until I was on the brink of suicide. That was another of those transformational moments because coming out of that, like that's what led me to then going deep into studying neuroscience, studying sp psychology, studying spirituality, confronting my own demons, doing that inner work, uh, which led me to then writing my book, Fear of Honor, to help others navigate their fear and their struggle, you know? All of that was another transformational moment. So to some, like some of these were thrust upon me, but after that especially is when I started to, because when I joined the Marines, I didn't consciously do it as a, as a way to seek evolution of the self. It was like, this is what I want to do. I wasn't as self-aware as I am now. But since then, since kind of coming out of that abyss of suicide, it was like now, how do I engineer such moments? Mm. How do I engineer these moments where one self dies and another is reborn? And Antarctica is that expression at its highest level because it's the biggest thing I've ever done, never been done before for a reason. If I can somehow pull it off, it's going to be game changing, right? And that's why even I've named the expedition the Great Soul Crossing. The idea is that it's a crossing of the soul from one life to the next. Mm -hmm. You know, I love this, that story from uh, ancient Greece where they, when somebody died, they would put coins on their eyes to pay the ferryman to, to ferry their soul from death, from one life to the afterlife. And it's kind of like, in my opinion, I believe in life, there should be many deaths and many rebirths. So one self dies and another is reborn. And these, and this happens through the crucible of struggle. Mm -hmm. through the crucible of suffering, to putting yourself, and this doesn't just mean physical, right? It can also mean mental, emotional. Like as you know, I've done darkness retreats where twice I spent one day, one time in seven days and the other time 10 days in pitch darkness, just complete darkness 24 seven sitting in a room. All of these moments, those weren't physically challenging, but mentally and spiritually extremely challenging. You know, so putting yourself in these moments that result in oneself dying and another being reborn. And that's, that's, that to me, I think, is not the essence of just growth and evolution, but it's how you feel more life in, in how you feel more alive in this human experience. Mm -hmm. that's, it's a beautiful way to kind of move through life, to experience that. Hey, folks, just a quick reminder that this episode sponsors are Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. You can get a free sample pack of Element Electrolytes by going to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO and 20% off your order of Delta G Ketones by going to deltagketones.com and entering promo code BITTER20. I wanted to talk to you a bit about the darkness retreat stuff because I think that has been something that has gotten a lot more public attention yeah. recently. I yeah. think you know, Aaron Rodgers did his yeah. four-day darkness retreat between his last season and this season, and it was one of those things where you know he's a big enough name where now yeah. people who otherwise would have never been exposed to it now are aware of what it is. Yeah. Probably a healthy bit of humor and lack of understanding too, but yeah. <laughs> um, I also have a buddy who's done it, uh, and... I think it was actually a similar, I think it might've been like the same place that Aaron Rodgers went to, but okay. you, you actually like introduced this to some people, didn't you? Like you were maybe one of the, I guess maybe, maybe the question here is how did you find out about 
darkness retreats and is this something that we've all been kind of ignorant to and has been around for a long time and it's just now kind of getting its light yeah it's definitely been around for a long long time i got into it because i went through a very very challenging divorce without going too deep into it my ex-wife kind of got up caught up in this cult and it was a crazy situation i ended up breaking my sobriety and when I do anything, I do it pretty hard. So I broke hard. Yeah. And I didn't like that version of me. So I was like, I'd already done a lot of physical challenges at this point. But I was like, something's missing. So let me confront this fear I have of stillness. And so I wanted to go deeper into the self. So I was going to go do a 10-day silent retreat. These, they're a thing called Vipassanas. They're much more common. And as I was researching it, I stumbled into this notion of a darkness retreat. And I was like, this is far more appealing to me because... In the darkness, we're shutting off one of the primary ways in which we engage with the world, your visual sense. Mm -hmm. So even in a simple way, I can look right now and say, that's a white wall. But my mind has somewhere external to latch onto. In the darkness, it has nowhere external to latch onto. So you're forced to go within. So that's how I stumbled upon it. And then I, had, I was very uh, blessed. I went on Aubrey Marcus's podcast, shared it with him. And then he went on to the same darkness retreat that I went to in Germany. And then I think he did a documentary about it, which kind of blew it up. So by no means did I introduce it to the world. I did help, I guess, uh, spread it a little bit. Yeah. And I think it's a, a blessing. Like I couldn't be more happy to have spread it, to help spread it, because it, I know it made a difference for Aubrey. It's made a lot of difference. And I think it's one of the most profoundly beautiful experiences to go to because in my experience of the human condition, I think one of the biggest fears we have is stillness. It's not something people, like if you ask somebody, what are you scared of? They'll say stillness, but we do everything and the world is, could not be more evident of that to distract ourselves from ourselves. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung even said, people will do anything no matter how absurd to avoid facing their own soul. And sometimes it's drinking drugs, binge watching Netflix, but sometimes it's even the positive things, watching, uh, you know, a working training often we do that even when i came back from iraq i went and did that i did a one month uh ski crossing of greenland dragging 190 pound sled for 350 miles across the ice cap beautiful expedition but back then i wasn't as aware and i was doing it just to escape my demons i did not want to deal with the stillness of the normal world and so it was actually after greenland that i hit that rock bottom but now i still do these things but i'm not doing it to escape i'm not doing it to run away so darkness is a beautiful way to confront yourself to be still with the soul and see what arises that's why i think it's a, a profoundly beautiful experience i could not recommend enough to anybody it'll it'll allow you to open doors within yourself that have never been opened before yeah yeah it's interesting i i mean the way you described it as like you're literally turning off one of your senses so mm -hmm. you're 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 shutting off an access point to mm -hmm. the world and then on top of it, you're consolidating yourself into a small room so, because exactly. in order to keep it dark, you kind of have to. Exactly. So to some degree, you're probably shutting off other things too. Like others, you're, you're shutting off such a magnitude of different sensory inputs that people have access to nowadays since we have access to so many different opportunities, exactly. yeah. which is both good and bad, like you kind of said, where yeah. you get yourself into trouble with that much information yeah. or that much stuff, where at a certain point, you almost have to hit the reset button. Exactly. And in the darkness, you also see lights because they say that your brain releases DMT in mm -hmm. that level of darkness. So you start to see lights that are as real as any other lights. And in those lights, shapes will form, and you call it what you want. Everybody, everybody I know who's gone to a darkness has experienced this, but you can call it God speaking to you to these, through these lights or the universe, consciousness, whatever your paradigm is. And that is very enlightening. Mm -hmm. It's very profound. I even journaled in the dark. I had a kind of ruler, and I was journaling, and the stuff that came through was really, really, really deep. You know, it allowed me to find new places within myself that allowed me to access new stages of my own evolution and then bring that to the trainings that I do, the people that I help and teach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you, I mean, minus the journaling, I suppose, did you have a hard time like recalling what you were thinking about or was there certain things? The, the, my, my only connection point to something like this is really like, I'll do a hundred mile race and one question I'll get is like, what are you thinking about what the whole thinking? time? Yeah. And I have the hardest time answering that question because there'll be like maybe two or three things for whatever reason my, my brain latches to. And I, I assume I'm kind of going over those over and over again. Mm. And that's why they stick in there mm -hmm. because there's such re repetition there. Mm. But there's also a bunch of stuff, almost like a you, if you have like a really vivid dream and then you wake up in the morning and you're like, wow, that was weird. And then later that afternoon, you've forgotten. You're like, there's elements of it that you're like, I I recalled this so vividly when I first woke up and now I've completely forgotten it. Yeah. There's, I, I assume there's that going on as well, where there's a lot of stuff that my mind is running through 
that sort of just gets kind of lost in the, the in the hard drive somewhere. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and I yeah. can't even tell people what it was because I've already forgotten about it. I can completely relate. I think sometimes, even sometimes interviews like this, people will ask me after, you know, how did it go? What questions he'd ask? And I'm like, I don't actually remember because uh, you're so in it, you know, yeah, you don't. Yeah. And the darkness is very similar. I mean, even my own journal, I came out reading portions of my journal being like, oh, because I don't remember writing that. Right. You know, and it was so moving to to read that, to see what was revealed through me through these messages. So there's definitely a lot of that. And there's others that I do remember vividly. Like I had what I perceived to be as a conversation with God that left me bawling in tears. And I can vividly remember the lights that I saw this hearing this voice and just you know the experience after that so there's some of that and some that i just uh are very kind of these like a dream like a very you know weird uh, kind of force that i have a vague memory of and some like some passages in my journal i don't remember at all and that's so cool to go through moments like that because you're so in the in the isness of that moment you know mm -hmm. the, the pure isness of that moment yeah i wonder if this would like kind of ruin the experience some degree but it would interesting to have like a voice recorder. I actually did think about that because the first time I went in the darkness, I chose to be silent. Uh, oh, because yeah. when you si when you when you speak to yourself, there's a feedback loop, right? I can hear my own words right now. So my the chaos of consciousness is silenced by hearing my own words. So I wanted to be with the chaos of that consciousness. The second time I went in the darkness, the 10 days, because the, the first time I went in, it was more kind of to heal. The second time I went in, it was pure training. It was training for Antarctica, mm -hmm. training for the solitude, the stillness, mastery over mind, mastery over self, being with myself, because I'll be with myself a lot when I'm in yeah. Antarctica. And that time I actually chose to speak out loud because that was an act of creation. Like one of the uh, tools I've really spent a lot of time studying is method acting. Are you familiar with? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, method acting is basically like those actors who they live and breathe the character. So Daniel Day Lewis, greatest method yeah. actor of all time, yeah. you know, or yeah. even Heath Ledger when he was playing the Joker, one of mastery of a performance, right? But even when the camera is not filming, Daniel Day Lewis will stay in character. Mm -hmm. So he lives and breathes, and, and he'll talk about how they actually dream and sleep and think and feel as the character, not as himself. So what fascinated me about that is that if you think about that, I mean. Here's a, a being who completely sheds his own identity. One director said of Daniel Day Lewis, I've never seen anybody come to uh, come as close to complete obliteration of the self. So he completely sheds his construct of his identity of Daniel Day Lewis and becomes something else. Now think about that in the in the lens of personal growth, because how we view ourselves is the we we, we have these constructs of our own identity, my nationality. Right? That's a construct of my own identity. And let me kind of elaborate on what I mean by that. Because most of how we engage with reality is a construct. Like even, for example, if I see with this white wall, I look at that and I've been taught from a young age that color is white and that thing that I'm seeing is a wall. But there's a pure, imperceptible moment between pure experience and the constructs we latch onto experience. It's imp impossible to even notice it unless you're in these kind of moments that we just talked about where you're so in the now, and that's why you kind of don't even remember it. But most of how we engage with the world is through these constructs that shape our experience of reality. And these constructs then define how we move through life. Like even when I did my first 24-hour run, you know, in the ultra world, as you know, it's not it's fairly common in the ultra running world to run a 24 hour run, right? Mm -hmm. I would say in the ultra running. But when I told my family in India, they didn't think that was possible. They had no idea that one could run for 24 hours. So in their construct of reality, that's impossible. But when you live in a world where that's normal, quote unquote, it changes how you engage with that experience, right? Because what makes a run long? For you, 50 miles would be nothing. For somebody who's never run, 50 miles would be the longest in the world because it's a construct of how we view it through, and our constructs are shaped by our beliefs, our paradigms, how we grew up, everything, right? And those constructs shape our, how we engage with the world. Now, the goal here is not to uh, release constructs because they're valuable, they, they help us move through life, but the goal is to become aware of them so they don't define you, they don't limit you. You know, even as an example, when I'm out on the ice, I often will say things like, I hope the weather will be what it is tomorrow. When I say that, 100% of the time I get what I want. <laughs> if I say, oh, I hope the weather is not stormy, I hope it's not too cold, cold is also a construct. I can be in minus 10 degrees, and I've experienced this where I'm warm, or I've been in 60 degrees and I'm cold, mm -hmm. right? So it's a construct of how we view it. And the more we can become aware of that, we can transcend it to create our own reality and how we experience it. So that was a core thing of what I'm doing in the darkness was method acting, was training and creating the person I need to be to ski across Antarctica. And I have like a whole series of trainings around this because I went deep, very obsessive, as I'm sure you can relate. Yeah. Uh, 
into studying it. So I've built like six hours of trainings around it uh, and, and really went deep into creating the, the identity and letting go of every construct that wasn't serving me and creating a new one that would help me do this mission that I need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and that means tapping into every force within your soul, like the darkness, the light. That's another thing. You know, Carl Jung also says, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. And we demonize the, the darkness, the fear, the pain that we go through as bad. You know, these things are bad, so we avoid them. But what was one of the most valuable things in my own healing journey from the war and now using it is, is the struggles that I went through. You know, I, uh, when I was in Iraq, my vehicle drove over an active bomb that didn't explode. My buddies drove over a bomb, it exploded, he died. Who knows why that happened? There's no reason for that. And when I came back, I struggled with survivor's guilt. I was told that, you know, it's not your fault, and I get it rationally. Bullets mm -hmm. fly where they fly in war, bombs explode, what, you know, you can't control that. But emotionally, I couldn't change the fact that I had that because the guilt was simply an expression of my love for my brother. It wasn't a bad emotion. There are no bad emotions. They're just emotions, and it's up to us to decide what we do with them. So instead of demonizing that guilt as bad, I reframed it. And for a long time, I had a picture of my friend that I lost in the war, and it said, this should have been you. Earn this life. Mm. Now my guilt became my ally. My guilt drove me to writing my book, Fear of Honor. It was the core essence of that, where I go much deeper into like sharing about the, the nature of our emotions and our experience with fear and st stress and anxiety, all these quote-unquote negative emotions. But that guilt became fuel, right? It was just how I viewed it. That guilt wasn't in and of in itself, itself the problem. So I tapped into my darkness, and now it became a weapon to move through life. And everything is the weapon if you choose to the world is your library so even and it's not like i'm always tapping into that space of you know feeling guilty sometimes it's pure gratitude it's bliss like you're using both the darkness and the light mm -hmm. as a tool to navigate but the more you play in all arenas the more you know which tool to use when you need it mm -hmm. yeah you probably get really good at recognizing when certain experiences draw a certain emotion out of you what tool to pull then so you're almost you're thinking not just about like what you've already connected the dots between which tools respond best to which emotions. So then it's more about identifying like what experience produced that and then kind of moving from there. Yeah. And a lot of it is experimentation. Like the mm -hmm. only thing, the only way to attain that mastery is you can listen to a podcast, read a book, and that's great. That can provide some insights, but the greatest lessons are do in the doing. Mm -hmm. You have to be in the arena. So as an example, you know, I was on an ultra a long time ago and I was, it was the middle of the night. I was running on my own. It wasn't a sort of a formal ultra, just on my own. I think it was an 80 mile run. And I decided to put all these audiobooks of very dark things. Like one was at the Holocaust. One was a survivor of sex trafficking, child soldiers. And the whole point was I would listen to these horrific stories and get perspective on my suffering. Like, oh, this is not so bad. They have a ton worse. But it sent me in a really dark place because I just went yeah. like, the world sucks. This sucks. Everything <laughs> sucks. The humanity's evil. And I'm like, all right, that didn't work too well, you know? <laughs> so you learn and you kind of experiment by doing that. But there was another time, you know, when I did this 167 mile run across Liberia, it was about a marathon a day for a week and on day five I had this aching pain hit my shin about 17 miles into the run and I started limping for a little bit and then I just started sprinting and the whole time I was saying things to myself like remember Neil Neil's my buddy who died in the war it should have been you that died instead of him suck it up if you quit now you deserve a coward's death you know and I was like Liberia has been through civil war Ebola poverty and I was like people are suffering all around you you have no right to complain. Earn this life. Suck it the fuck up. Like saying this very dark things to myself, but that was a valuable place to go. Those last few miles I ran on that day were the fastest I ran the entire trip. Mm -hmm. I didn't always talk to myself like that. A lot of the other times it was just gratitude, bliss for the experience. But the more you access all these forces, the more you know which one has value. And this is the point. Like we've all been through hard times in life, part of the human experience. Instead of running away from it, use it as fuel. Like I actually, I firmly believe in the core of my soul that there is a, death I, a debt I owe for this life that I've been gifted. Beyond just the times I should have died in Iraq and many other times, you know, I've been blessed with great parents who gave me a good life. I've, I've volunteered in um, leper colonies. I've seen people in extreme poverty, worked with former child soldiers, with survivors of sex trafficking, these people born into hell on earth. Just by being born where they were born, they were in, in thrust into hell. Simply by being born where I was born, I was blessed with a million times more opportunities than most. I didn't do anything to earn that. So in my paradigm, I believe there's a debt I owe for this life I've been gifted. Now, I'm not saying that's a right way to think. A lot of people are like, that's unhealthy and that's okay. The point is not to say that my way is the way. It's to say that whatever 
struggles you've experienced, your darkness, your pain, find a way to turn that into a frame, into a construct that serves you, that drives you forward. Like I love my life. I couldn't be happier. And I'm not always thinking about this debt that I owe, but there are times where that is the most valuable place to go, especially when I'm in the suck out on expedition. I'll be really in the suck and be like, people have it a lot worse. You owe a debt for this life. Suck it up. Keep going. Mm -hmm. So turn your darkness into fuel. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I want to I want to go back because you said you were kind of looking into the method actor stuff yeah. to kind of like, you know, draw from that, I suppose. Yeah. Did you, like, what, what's the deal with those guys and gals when they come out of that? Do they have a hard time returning to their former self or do they even want to? Or what is, I guess Daniel day is maybe the, yeah, as you said, one of the best. I wonder yeah. if he is purposefully not returning to his former self or if he goes into that thinking, once this is over, I need to like kind of, refocus and get back to who I was before. He really struggles. He really struggles. He talked about after Lincoln, which again, epic performance, right? Mm -hmm. He talked about after that how much he struggled because in a way you are you're you're creating a death mm -hmm. of an identity you have built. You know? And so that's why he's does he does a very few movies. He's now retired from acting. Yeah. But throughout his career he's done like ten movies, eleven, not that many. You know, even being what I would argue is the greatest actor of all time. And he would really struggle because he's, he's, he's shedding this entire identity he's built and there's a death that is now happening. So there's a kind of mourning that happens of that death in order to then step back to Daniel Day-Lewis. But I would argue too, and he kind of says this, it's not like he's entirely stepping back into Daniel Day-Lewis because he's, he's, he's taking in each identity he's built and it's affecting how he's now stepping back into the, the, the identity of Daniel Day-Lewis, right? But there's definitely a challenge in letting go of that construct letting go of those, that identity. I mean, even now, you know, when I, when I go, I'm training for Antarctica of 110 days of solitude. So I actually kind of struggle in crowds a little bit. Now that's a useful, uh, useful mechanism for what I'm doing. And when I come back from Antarctica, there'll be a lot of course correcting to readjust yeah. to normal life. You know, <laughs> right now I don't care about course correcting that. I don't care about fixing that. I know I could, because I did, even after the war, I really struggled in crowds. I really struggled with loud noises. I've addressed a lot of that, but I kind of rebuilt it in a way because of what I'm doing in Antarctica. So you create an identity, and then you can let it go. And yes, that is challenging, but I think it's still so valuable because you can create whatever you want, whatever you need. And the malleability of our identity is what's so valuable. You know, everything within us, like neuroplasticity, the brain is plastic. It can change. It can be rebuilt. Even our memories. I go deep into this in Fearvana, so without going too deep into now, the, the way we think about our past is not real. Like when we access our memories, we're not accessing kind of like a video camera on a screen. Every time we access our memory, we're accessing the last time we access that memory. So every time we enter into X memory, let's say I ask you, what did you do on your 25th birthday? And I ask you that every day for the next year. Every time you access it, you're actually rechanging the neuronal structure of that memory based on how you accessed it last. Hmm. So if every time you access it in a, let's say in a very disempowered state, you're feeling really sad, the actually content of that memory will change. And they've done a lot of studies on this. One researcher did a study where she asked nine people after 9-11, where were you? And asked them a bunch of questions. Five years later, asked them the same questions. And not only small details shifted, but huge details like even where they were when it happened. So when you recognize the malleability of our memory, the value of that is you can essentially create whatever you want, you know, because nothing about how we approach the reality is quote unquote real. It's a construct and the malleability of that has value. To one degree, it can create a kind of apathy, like if nothing is real, then who cares, right? Like we can kind of get nihilistic, but I don't think that's, that's the answer there. I think the value of knowing that is if my memories aren't inherently quote unquote real, I can create them to serve me in whatever way I want. I can find new meanings to them. I can alter the structure of that. And I can even use memories, like this was one thing I started doing when I was in the Arctic, is using the how memories work to alter how a future version of me will think about this, this, this experience. Like I'll give you an example. So when I was in the Arctic, every day I would sit in the tent, I was on a solo expedition, I, would, I was knowing that a future version of me, like the version sitting here today, is going to think about this event a certain way. And our memories shape how we engage with reality. Mm -hmm. Like, why do I know to pick up this bottle and drink it? Because I have a sense of, you know, this is how a water bottle works. I open it because there's a memory around that. Mm -hmm. Memories shape everything about how we engage with the world. So in my present self in the Arctic, I was sitting there and I was, going, I was remembering all the awesome things about this experience. I was smiling. I was sometimes listening to happy music. So I was, quote unquote, infecting the memory with 
positivity, with joy, knowing that future version of me is going to think about this a certain way. I'm going to control how I want future version of me to think about this because that future version will then look back on the Arctic and then determine how I view the next thing. So even with running, for example, if every time I step into the run, I'm like, this really sucks. <laughs> it's going to shape my memory. Yeah. But you can manipulate that, right? That's the value of the malleability of the brain is that you can manipulate and create however you want to serve you. And method acting is kind of that on steroids, if you will, because they're literally building entirely new, even memories. They're creating a memory around their character. And that's kind of what I was doing to, to build who Akshay needs to be in order to ski across Antarctica. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I... I I like to think with running, it's like stage one is looking at it as punishment or something that you have to do. And like, you got to graduate from that. Yeah. You got to graduate that. to that to like what a lot of people probably call like type two fun, which is the gratification you get when you finish. Yeah. And you want to, you want to recognize that as the focal point yeah. is that's the target, not the, you know, don't look at the discomfort that you may experience at certain stages during the run as the point to kind of attach the emotion to, but yeah. rather the hard work that you're going through there is going to produce the type two fun that you're experiencing yeah. afterwards. And it's the, the latter doesn't come without the former. Yeah. Therefore you should appreciate it, not look exactly. bad at it. Look it's negative, gift. I should say on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting stuff. Um, I want to get into kind of the logistics of this project because yeah. it's just insane. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm familiar enough with logistics of planning some long haul stuff just from talking to people who've done it. Yeah. I was planning a transcontinental project that got derailed due to an injury. Yeah. Eventually I'll get around to doing that again. Awesome. But you know, I went through the phase of like kind of trying to plan that thing. And one thing I recognized during that was there is an infinite number of things you could try to account for. So at a certain point you have to sort of step back and just start itemizing what are the things that I can't neglect that mm -hmm. I need to make sure I have accounted for and what are things that will probably pop up or may or may not pop up, but there are just, just acknowledging there's going to be things I can't prepare for perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to have to be okay with that and then be ready to respond to them when they come. Yeah. So is, how do you look at the planning process for something like this? I mean, it's, it's like, a transcontinental project on on steroids yeah. essentially yeah. <laughs> yeah you know a lot learning from wiser people than myself i have a lot of polar friends and mentors one of my kind of biggest polar mentor a guy named eric phillips a great polar explorer polar adventurer and he's taught me a ton so i've also studied kind of every expedition in modern history that's how i even came up with the number 110 days i wasn't arbitrary right mm -hmm. so how do you so looking at previous expeditions to study the data of them and then obviously being in the arena a lot i've spent a lot of time in the polar realm myself learning from that experience taking into account all the factors because as you said you can't prepare for everything but i want to be as as conscious as possible about being ready for anything that's going to throw my come my way you know and a big part of that is what like what they call negative visualization you don't it, it's not framed often in the in, in like the world doesn't talk about this because it sounds quote unquote negative but even astronauts will look at everything that could potentially go wrong so you can prevent that you know, one of my many mantras is fear propels you to prepare. Mm -hmm. So I'm terrified of Antarctica. So I will look at all the things that could go wrong. And I've made a few mistakes on smaller expeditions. I made a mistake with my stove that sent this giant fireball that could have burnt down the tent, you know. <laughs> Thankfully, it didn't. But, uh, mm -hmm. but learn from that. So studying that, taking my experience, and now mapping out every little detail. And then ALE, who has a wealth of experience, ALE is uh, Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions. They're the ones who, do, who manage the logistics for every adventurer on, in Antarctica. And they, of course, are the ones who are organizing all the logistics of getting me to where I need to go. And they've had a wealth of experiences in this arena. So my job is to plan the expedition alone with the help of mentors and friends, taking my own experience. They're planning all the logistics of getting me to where I need to go, picking me up. I mean, I have a satellite phone out there to call if something goes wrong. You know, I mean, when I was in Antarctica two years ago, I lost two fingers to frostbite and we had to call through the satellite phone. So that's, it's, I mean, it's, but to your point, you know, every little detail, the smallest detail has to be taken into account. So gear list, triple checking, 10 times checking my gear list, you know, the food plan, the weight, every little detail is measured and even practicing. I'm practicing at home 
doing everything with mittens on. Because in Antarctica, every little thing is a challenge. Peeing is a challenge. Mm -hmm. How do you do all that with mittens on? Yeah. You know, so practicing that, even eating my food, I have a bag of, of nuts and chocolates. You can't just stick your hand in there to grab that. You have mittens. So having a ladle, my friend Eric was the one who, who enlightened me to that idea. You know, taking a ladle and then stuffing that in your mouth. Or another, I met these other uh, travelers, polar travelers when I was in the Arctic. They came up with the idea of putting a, a tent, a poop hole in your tent. So you actually, and I'd never thought about that. And so on previous expeditions, I had to go outside to poop. And when you're in minus 30 degrees and the wind is hammering you, uh -huh. it is absolutely a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I'm all about the suffering, but that was not a suffering I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> that sucked, <laughs> you know? So they taught me, put a poop hole in your tent. So I sewed like a, uh, like cut a, f a, a little hole in the tent with Velcro, one side sewn in, and you become a flap. Mm -hmm. So now you could poop inside the tent, and you just dig a little hole in the snow. All those little details make a huge difference. And at home, I'm practicing eating, putting on my polar gear, peeing, the, the position of pooping. I'm practicing because sometimes you may go, have to go while you're skiing, you know. Hopefully not. That's not fun. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Or also like, like even unzipping my sled to get the water bottles out. You make, want to make sure your water balls don't kind of slip at the bottom of your sled. How can I do that as efficiently as possible? Because if I lose even five minutes a day over 100 days, that's 500 minutes. That's 500 minutes of skiing time to cover this massive distance I need to cover. So I need to be as perfect as possible. And that comes with practicing all those things till I can do it blindfolded. Setting up my tent with mittens on. Can I do it blindfolded? You know, mm -hmm. when you're being hammered by hurricane force winds, that's a challenge to do, yeah. you know, so doing all of, and if you let go of your tent, you're in a world of hurt. So you cannot let go of that thing. You know, all of those little details make, yeah. make a huge difference. So are you just like setting your tent up on repeat a ton during this phase when you're not out there yet? Yeah. Uh, it's been, we've just moved into a new place with my fiance. So now kind of setting it up, but yes, once I get back, I'll be doing that in Minnesota. I'll be doing that in, in the winter, you know, mm -hmm. is doing that and in, in, in doing it consistently, especially when you're tired because you're going to have to do it when you're tired out there at yeah. the end of a 12 hour day of skiing and it, you cannot afford to be complacent. You know, one of the things in Iraq, we always used to say complacency kills mm -hmm. and it does, you know, cause you can get complete, like in war, you could get complacent two months, you're not getting shot at and then you'd get a little complacent and that's the one day something goes wrong, mm -hmm. you know? So even in Iraq, like my job was to walk in front of our vehicles looking for bombs before they could be used to kill me and my fellow Marines. That's a very easy job to get complacent. Mm. Two months, nothing happens. You're like, ah, I don't have to pay attention. Yeah. You know, and I was far from perfect at it, at, at not getting complacent, but I really tried my best to not. Thankfully, nothing happened. But in Antarctica, it's the same thing, right? It's, mm -hmm. you cannot afford that. So practicing all that to make sure I'm on point. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about the just the planning of everything and then the practice because there's yeah. the training obviously which takes up a ton of time, yep. but then there's yep. also like the logistics the of like setting skills. yeah exactly. the technical exactly the technical exactly. skills that need to be able to be done on on uh, just basically cruise control essentially exactly. so exactly and then like you said with some extreme weather, so I guess the stages are learn to do it really really good just at home yep stress test at one more level out in Minnesota. Yeah and then refine anything that maybe needs to be refined based on a little more of a specific uh, environment. And then that's probably close enough so that when you're out there at the Arctic, it won't be like, you won't be, get caught off guard with too much of a difference in terms of what it's actually gonna require to do all that stuff with mittens and everything you kind of described. Exactly, yeah, I mean, that's even why I was in the Arctic earlier this year was, uh, it was spent about 29 days out in the field, 20 of that was solo. Uh, is just practicing again, practicing solo time, practicing being out there, and then Minnesota will be continuing to refine. You know, after the Arctic, for <laughs> for example, one of the a bold decision I made that was I think I think necessary for Antarctica, because when I when I was in Antarctica two years ago, I got frostbite on two fingers, mm -hmm. and this finger, the the right uh, ring finger here, it was black and it had to go. Mm -hmm. The left middle finger, it recovered fully. Mm -hmm. But then the point of this is to stay with the importance of training and refining. When I was in the Arctic, because once you get frostbite, you're always more prone to frostbite. Yeah. So this finger, it recovered fully, but very, it would get slightly colder than all my other fingers. Yeah. You know, because it got, had frostbite. It was quite bad. It was like black and very gnarly. Mm -hmm. And um, so after the Arctic, I made a call to preemptively cut that finger off cut the tip of this finger off because I didn't want it as a liability. Mm. Imagine I'm 60 days in Antarctica. I'm at the South Pole, the coldest point, yeah. and I get frostbite. My expedition's over. 
that's a huge risk that I don't want to take. So I just, I was like, I'm going to remove the tip, you know? Yeah. So all these previous expeditions and now Minnesota, hopefully no more fingers left to go, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but just learning, refining, taking, doing every little thing possible, including the willingness to lose a finger if need be to pull this off, you know? So all those little technical skills, the physical skills, the mental skills to get ready. And Minnesota is the last kind of time on the battlefield on the playground before the big one next year. Yeah. Well, and we were chatting a little yesterday too about like why Minnesota and obviously Minnesota this time of year or coming up this time of year is a pretty good playground to practice in cold, yeah. brutal weather, but it's not the Antarctic or it, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not where you're going to be. And yeah. one of the reasons why like that is the reality versus actually going out there and playing is the logistics and the expenses of things yeah. like that. Like, what does it actually entail to put on something like this financially? Yeah. So the uh, the crossing will cost seven hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. It is not cheap, and that's not a number I made up. Ale, who manages all the logistics, they quoted me that because. You know, for, for one, the flight from Chile to Antarctica alone is like a $50,000 flight. Then the flight from Union Glacier, the main base camp, to the other end of Antarctica, which is my end point, Bay of Wales, is like a $200,000 flight from what I understand. So that's a third of it right there. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's not even just like one flight. It, to get out to Bay of Wales, you're landing in the middle of Antarctica, like in barren nothingness to refuel, you know, so there's a fuel drum out there. So somebody has to put that fuel drum out there. And then even the staff, because normal Antarctic season for adventurers is 85 days. ALE goes out there every year, this this time of year. So Antarctic season is about to start. It's November is, is Antarctic summer. Um, and they set up a base camp called Union Glacier. And then they break it down before the season ends. So that season is about 85 days. They have to extend that season just for me to pull this off. So while they won't have a full staff, they will have a skeleton crew because you have to if like a doctor on staff, a, a pilot, a radio operator, a logistic crew, like a little skeleton crew to support this expedition. Mm-hmm. So that that's that all costs money, you know. So and they're there just for you, essentially, because no one else is out there days. at that point. Yeah, at that point, exactly. <laughs> the 85 days, Union Glacier is like a really awesome kind of really cool place to be. I was there uh, two years ago. You meet some cool characters, right? Everybody out there is yeah. doing some wild stuff. So uh, Union Glacier during the 85 days is pretty packed, but after that is done, they'll break it down, but there will be a small skeleton crew essentially just for me, you know? Uh, so they, that all costs, that's why it really adds up. So even this year, I wanted to go to Antarctica, like right now I'd be on my way there to do a shorter expedition as a training, but that costs money. So to save money for the crossing, I'm going to Minnesota, finding the cheapest way to kind of replicate and boundary waters region of minnesota will be sufficiently savage Mm -hmm. like one of my polar explorer friends said she's experienced the coldest temperatures in entire polar career more than antarctica and the north pole in the boundary waters yeah so we'll be savage i'll get that obviously it's not the same as antarctica but it's the cheapest and the most effective way to replicate that so i can save money for the crossing and we're also you also we also have a crowdfunding campaign up uh, some 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 people are really supporting through high high network donors, and our crowdfunding campaign has reached two hundred thousand dollars so far. But we still have a a ways to go, and so uh, it's like yeah, it's my whole world right now is training mind, body, spirit, and fundraising. Yeah, to pull this off. Yeah, there's that aspect of yeah. it too. The yeah, the boundary waters in winter. You know, I lived in Minnes- or I'm sorry, I lived in Wisconsin for twenty years. Yeah, and like before I moved from there. I was doing like, I was training for, I think I was, yeah, I was training for ultra marathons at the time, but I was teaching as well. So yeah. I'd wake up at four, four thirty in the morning to go for a run. And we had one winter that was particularly brutal. And I think the worst it got was a 55 below wind chill. But my protocol during that was essentially like, I didn't even care what the temperatures were anymore. When I would wake up in the morning, I had like a standard protocol of what I knew I had to have, like yeah. a minimum, like base. And then it just depended on the wind chill from there. Yeah. Because if it was like five below in four mile an hour winds, like, cool, I don't have to put on that yeah. extra shell. If it was five below, but 25 mile an hour winds, yeah. that is a whole different environment yeah. to be in. The wind is the yeah. most savage. Yeah. But, but talking about the boundary wise, I remember anytime, and this is kind of like almost full circle, you're talking about trying to like frame it in a positive way. I'd always think like, oh man, it's like, say it's 25 below zero. I'd look over what's in northern Minnesota, and they'd always have it much worse. Like, ah, those guys exactly. are dealing yeah. with <laughs> At least that's not there. So yeah, I remember one particular day. I think this was the record low. Probably, it was probably that, like, 55 below day. I looked. There was a spot up in 
in northern Minnesota, it was like 80 below wind chill. So I was like, oh my goodness, yeah. that's just, <laughs> can't even imagine. The like, wind is uh, yeah. <laughs> unforgiving. So you'll have all that you bargain for, I think. Exactly. Yeah. It should be sufficiently <laughs> savage to, <laughs> to prep me yeah. for what's coming. Yeah, and to some, so, to some degree, it may actually be better because it's, logistically easier to get there That's so you're not a huge factor you're not dealing with a bunch of lost like latent time between all right i'm gonna do this to i'm actually starting the actual act of going out into it yeah you'll just head up to minnesota and a day or two later you could be out in it if exactly you want to. exactly mm -hmm. much more logistically easier and even the fact like that's a big reason why you know 35 days at an airbnb one just spending more time with my fiance because mm -hmm. She's putting up with a lot. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a unique character to be with. Uh, but also, you know, other than training, I still have a lot of fundraising work. So this time, at least I'll go out for skiing for four or five hours every day. But I'll come back and do work, spend time with her. And then then the 35 days will be completely solo in the wilderness. So balancing that, but it will it'll be much much more logistically easier to pull that off. I mean, we get mm -hmm. there, get an Airbnb. We've already got that set up. Next day, I can be out skiing, you know, to your point. Mm -hmm. So it's cheaper, easier, logistically in every way. And, uh, and she couldn't theoretically fly to Antarctica, right? So, <laughs> so this makes it easier to also navigate all that while trying to do the work elements in addition to the training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about just something you said earlier and then just the actual like process here to, if my math isn't, if I didn't miss like a zero or something in here, it's, you'll, you'll be going probably around 17 miles a day. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's 1700, about 15 to 16. It's 110 okay. days. Yeah. 15 to 16. 15 yeah, to 16. 16. And when you think about that, it's 12 hours of moving for 15 to 16 miles. That kind of gives you perspective of like how slow well, of moving. a exactly. process that, <laughs> which is important because there is, there's a stimulus to moving faster. Yes. That obviously there's like a threshold where if you continue to do that, then like things tend to fall apart on yeah. you. Yeah. But there's that in the moment, like stimulus of it being more, more fun in my opinion 100 percent. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's why i like kind of like steady state tempo run sometimes because it's either, they're just fast enough where you get like a little bit of an increase like a yeah. nose will burst in that stimulus but they're also sustainable enough where you can do a meaningful amount of time in it on, a, on yeah. any given run to the degree where like you sort of have like a little bit of a better kind of type two aftermath of that sort of, a, of an experience but you're just going to be out there like inching along plodding along yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah that's a big reason why the tire dragging is not only physical training it's great mental training because mm -hmm. you're moving so damn slow yeah around this tiny little park you know so this is the monotony element of it uh but yeah to your point it's very very slow because of just how much weight you're hauling you know, I'm choosing to do this unsupported, meaning like I'll have all my own supplies for the entire 110 days, as opposed to, let's say, having gear caches or something like that, you mm -hmm. know, and it is a uh, mind numbingly slow. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very sexy sport to watch either. Like we are filming a documentary around it on the ice. I'll be alone, but they've came and they've come and filmed me in the Arctic and sure. Iceland. They filmed me in Arizona training. But unlike, you know, some gnarly backcountry ski sports where they're flying down a hill, yeah. this is just an idiot plodding along yeah. very slowly. <laughs> so it's not a very sexy <laughs> sport put to you on watch. Fast forward. Yeah. <laughs> exactly you're gonna uh, somebody watching will lose interest very quickly <laughs> yeah yeah so this is obviously is unprecedented in the sense that you'll be the first person to do this if it goes off yeah as planned is there anything you can think of that comes reasonably close to it that you're like all right that's a that's as far as we've gotten so far so they may have at least a perspective that you can lean into a bit for sure there's definitely a, a great polar adventurers that have done epic feats like Borge Ausland he's a Norwegian has done one of the most epic polar journeys uh, in my opinion in the in the world where just a, a few years ago at 57 years old he crossed the Arctic Ocean mm -hmm. you know and he was in the dead of winter uh, him and Mike Horn did this or uh, another guy Rune Gildness is also a Norwegian he's him and Tori Larson crossed the entire Arctic Ocean unsupported from Russia to Canada in 109 days I mean they were on the brink of death when they came the book about it is called Dead Men Walking mm. you know and to cross the Arctic Ocean is a very different animal than Antarctica. It's it's I, I would argue and I haven't experienced it, but from other adventurers I know who've been through both say it's physically much harder, but mentally a little easier because in Antarctica it's just the empty white nothingness, and in, in in the Arctic you're skiing on a frozen ocean, so they'll have like open water leads, like just these giant sections of open water, or these ice rubbles will crash into each other, and then you have to take the sled up and down these kind of rubbles of ice. So it's a little bit more mentally stimulating to have those kind of constant obstacles to deal with, but physically a beast you mm -hmm. know and Borges has done 
part of that in winter, and even Tori Larson and Rune Gilness's expedition. So definitely a lot of great um, adventurers to learn from, to follow, that have pushed the very boundaries. Uh, it's just this is kind of the last great adventure that hasn't been accomplished. But Borge Ausland was actually the, the first person to ski across Antarctica. When he did it, the feat had never been done. So his goal was just to do it. So mm-hmm. he used actually a small kite just for portions of the journey. He actually skied a significant, a good amount of it without the kite as well, but used a kite for portion of the journey. And style evolutions like doing it without a kite happen a- after the pioneer. Like he's a true pioneer, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm sort of humbly following in his footsteps. But he, uh, my friend Eric Phillips, he skied like four new routes to the South Pole. Another buddy of mine, Lou Rout, has pulled some pretty expedition, uh, pretty awesome expeditions. So kind of learning from the, the the great explorers before you know who've who've, who've done some epic feats uh but this is so that that's what i've taken to prepare for this this just happens to have you know sort of never been done and it is it is kind of the last great un, unaccomplished feat in antarctic exploration and i would say the last other one is to do a coast is to do a land-to-land crossing of the arctic through the north pole solo mm-hmm. it's been done as a group but never been done solo as well these two are, are kind of the last in the polar realm uh, that haven't been accomplished yet. So, mm-hmm. uh, but learning from them to hopefully be able to pull it off. Yeah. It sounds like you've done this. I know one, uh, w- one person I like to listen to talk about preparing for events is Jim Walmsley because he, mm-hmm. he'll talk about how when he's like picking like a goal time and a target, he'll do, he'll go and he'll run like portions of say a hundred yeah. mile course and he'll get like, try to get like a good feeling for like, what is a range of time that mm-hmm. I can expect to be able, like what's reasonable here. Yeah. It, trying to associate like, you know, the act of being tired at the end and things like that. So like, I think he's probably got like a threshold where he knows on fresh legs, relatively speaking, if I can cover it in here, then that's, this is a good target. And he's just yeah. done it enough now where he can probably ballpark things pretty nicely. You, there must be something with that where you're coming up with the 15 to 16 miles a day where you know, like, you're not going to go to Minnesota and find out, oh, shoot, it's going to be closer to yeah, 11. <laughs> for sure. Exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, there, the, theoretically, I could. I mean, the, the highest outcome of failure, I mean, death is a very small possibility because, again, as I said, it's not super dangerous compared to uh, some other feats. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that you can't eliminate that risk. But the right. highest outcome of failure was I just couldn't pull off the distance. So that is there. But I've take, I've studied other adventurers to see – you know, like, because nobody's done the full coast to coast crossing, but they've done portions of that journey from the F- Berkner Island to the no- South Pole or from Bay of Wales to South Pole, looking at how long did it take them, taking a little bit of that into account, obviously taking my own experiences into account to kind of come up with that number. But even, I mean, last season, there were three teams, three, ad- three uh, a- adventurers that attempted a partial crossing of Antarctica, not a full coast to coast, a partial crossing, all three failed. Mm. just because they couldn't cover the distance. I mean, they're all still alive. Thankfully, everybody made it home safely, but they couldn't cover the distance needed to cover. So, I mean, even Steve Jones, Steve is a friend of mine. He's the expedition manager at ALE, tracked every expedition in modern history, has said that anyone who attempts this will probably fail. Mm. You know, when, one of the reasons why we had to move it from this year, where I was originally supposed to do a full crossing this year, to next year, one is just we needed more money, but two was ALE was only able to give me 105 days. And Steve himself said, you know, we just don't think anybody will last even over 100 days. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so there's no point kind of giving yeah. anymore. And, uh, and I get it. And he's like, I'm not trying to say this to be mean. It's just the nature of this feat. So I'm well aware that the odds are stacked against me. And I, I mean, if you get, like if I get soft snow at the start, and it is what it is. You get what you get, and you have to be with that. You cannot. That's a huge thing I've seen sometimes. Adventurers will say things like, oh, these conditions were worse this year than every other year. And I'm not faulting them for it. Like, Antarctica is savage every year, but I cannot let myself get into that mindset because then that becomes a negative downward spiral Mm -hmm. instead of actually just whatever's thrown at you, accepting the isness of that. Like when I was in the Arctic earlier this year, I got hammered with these two days of massive polar storms. I was out there alone. Next day I'm skiing and there's a lot of soft snow on the ground, right? Which made it very harder to go up and down this undulating terrain in Norway with my heavy sled. And I could say, I wish there was hard snow, but instead I just kept saying, thank you God for these perfect conditions. Because everything is perfect in its isness, for it cannot be anything other than what it already is. Hmm. Everything. It cannot be anything other than what, what it already is, and therefore is perfect. The more you learn to accept the isness of things, whether they be external or even internal, meaning that even our emotions, right? Like right now, if somebody comes into this room with a gun, I'll feel fear. I'm not choosing to feel fear. I'm not 
asking for it, but I'll feel it in response to this external stimuli. Most of our thoughts and our feelings, we don't control in response to external stimuli. Instead of demonizing that, trying to resist it, make it go away because it's quote unquote a bad emotion, accept it. The more you train yourself to accept the isness of your emotions, of your thoughts, of, your, of the external stimuli, instead of resisting it, the more you can then transcend it and choose how you relate to it. That's the power, right? So that's a big mindset shift for me is whatever Antarctica throws my way, it is not good, it is not bad, it is. And mm-hmm. I will make it, at the core of it, it just is, and I will make it good. I will smile in the face of it. And hopefully be able to pull off this uh, massive distance, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild to think about. I am excited for you. Thank you, brother. I think it'll be well, it'll be a great story one way or the other. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. either way, something. Because even beyond, even if somehow I don't pull off the crossing, just being out there 110 days alone. Oh, no doubt. Will yeah. be profoundly beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, one other thing I was, I mean, just thinking of the logistics yeah, you fall a mile short per day, you're looking at an additional seven days, right? So like you can't. I can't. Yeah, it's just, it, so at, at what point, I know you said earlier, you're operating on a framework of 12 hours of work, four hours of prep and essentially snow melting for yeah. water and whatnot, and then eight hours of sleep. At what point do you start carving into the 12 hours that are non-moving in order to maintain the 15 to 16 miles per day? It's hard to say because initially when I first start, I will not start right away at 12 hours. So mm-hmm. you're at a deficit from almost day one like because you don't want to uh, – from every polar adventurer who's been out there, I've studied again from all of them, you don't want to start going ham because you want to get your body used to that absurd workload. Mm-hmm. And so if you go all in 12 hours right at the get-go, you're going to break very quickly. Uh, so start at about eight, nine hours and then okay. build. But you're now immediately putting yourself in a deficit of mileage. Mm-hmm. You're also, remember, I mean, initially it'll be flat on the ice shelf, but then going uphill. Yeah. So I have to make up distance on the back end when I'm going downhill. Thankfully, I'll be going downhill and the sled will be lighter. Mm-hmm. But as far as uh, eating into that 12 or eating into or extending that 12 hours, the only place I can sacrifice is sleep, right? Mm-hmm. Less than ideal. Because even at eight hours, you're going to be under recovered from kind of yeah. the get go, you know? Um, but it'll kind of be determined. I mean, Let's say I get the best snow ever, and at eight hours I'm hitting the distance. Sweet, yeah. you know. So yeah. uh, it'll kind of be determined because another guy, Ben Saunders, whose expedition I follow, he was hitting some massive distances at nine-hour days, mm-hmm. which kind of the distances I need to hit with a similar type sled. So I was like, all right, if I get that, cool. You yeah. know, I can I can hit nine hours, and then maybe on a good day I push a little bit more just to build distance. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it will depend on what I'm able to do, what the conditions uh, make it as. Um, feasible to do and uh, and then you know ma- adding more time if need be and and that means sacrificing sleep because the four hours of tent time you can't really you you the tent time takes what it takes setting up the tent breaking down the tent and then boiling snow for water that takes what it takes mm-hmm. you can't do much to make that more efficient there's a little things but for the most part you can't do yeah. anymore so the only place i can eat into is sleep and is- uh is there a way to track where you're at for this? Is there going to be like a GPS unit where you can there go on a be. website and be like, oh, yeah, he Yeah, there'll be a live like tracker <laughs> that both ALE will be watching as well. Okay. Uh, so they'll be know exactly where I am. And thankfully, as I said, it's not super dangerous for the most part of entirely if, the entirety of Antarctica except one glacier. They can pick me up if things get horrible, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, so they, that evacuation possibility is there. So they'll be tracking and even people back home can kind of follow along a live tracker maybe not every day but every other day i'll be sending audio updates from the ice as well so on the live tracker there's a little audio button and you can oh hear. really yeah it's kind of cool okay, the tech yeah. is awesome yeah uh, there's a company zero six zero that does this they're awesome uh, buddies of mine anthony so they're they kind of create the tech it's pretty badass what you can do now yeah, yeah. it's yeah, no cool. kidding yeah okay so is this all going to be like accessible on your website or it is okay. yeah i'll have it uh you know, I share the journey right now, preparing at Instagram at Fearvana. Fearvana, okay, that's A R V A N A. The book is obviously Fearvana, and even on the website Fearvana, that's where uh, we'll have the live tracker, and we'll also write like right now. There's the website GreatSoulCrossing.com. Mm-hmm. That's S O U L Great Soul Crossing. Right now, it's the crowdfunding page, but eventually that'll also be the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the place to follow along with the journey too. Mm-hmm. So it'll be on both Fearvana and Great Soul Crossing. 
Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So those are the spots to find you. Is that where yeah. you go to, to donate if someone wants to help support? Yeah. The trip? Thank you for asking. You know, the Great Soul Crossing, you'll find that link even at Fairvana and on Instagram, but Great Soul Crossing, you can find the donation. Uh, and, you know, we have different, we're offering different like gifts, rewards for different donation tiers. So for example, I touched on the method acting. I have like a six hour deep dive training mm. along with every mindset training I've developed over the years of pushing the boundaries on the edge uh, on there. If you donate, like I think it's nine ninety nine, you get access to all of it. And every tier, even the small donations of $30, there's a different training on how I did uh, 25 different weapons to navigate the pain cave, mm -hmm. whether it be physical or emotional pain, you know? So at different donation tiers, we are giving away things and I'm not making a dollar off this campaign to be clear. Like, you know, it sounds like it's all going towards going directly <laughs> towards this. So any contributions are extremely well received. Even the book fear Vana, it's on Amazon, audible paperback, Kindle, and it is, uh, we were donating all the profits to charity. So constantly, like, on, on only right now, shifted it to the crossing. And then after the crossing, it'll go back to, uh, to other causes. But I'm not making a dollar off the book either. It's all going towards, you know, something. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we'll be filming a documentary. So it's not just, while I do get a lot from this journey spiritually, the stories we tell through it will be able to, well, I mean, I've already experienced this from speaking on shows like this, speaking on stages. It inspires people to play on their own edges. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying Antarctica is the path to enlightenment. That's my path, but it's not the path, right? The goal is ultimately help people find their own edges and play on those edges because that's where you find the rewards of the human spirit. Perfect. And we'll tell stories to help people do that. Well, it's been awesome to record in person with you this time Likewise, around. Brother. And hopefully we can do it again after you've got... Hell yeah. A massive record under your belt. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hope, hope to pull it off and uh, would definitely be in stand touch, man. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your time in Austin. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Take care. All right, everyone. If you're still here, you're sticking around to hear about how I use the show sponsor Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. For Element, they make an electrolyte supplement. So what I know about me is that I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes per liter of fluid loss. So what that means is if I go out for a run and I lose two liters of sweat, then I'm also going to lose roughly 1,228 milligrams of electrolytes with it which ironically happens to be about one packet of Element. So what I likely will do is if I'm going out for a longer training session or I'm gonna be out in the heat and sweating a lot, I'm gonna supplement the fluid intake I have with electrolyte to make sure I have that stuff in balance. The way this usually looks for me is I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll put half of one of those packets in with my coffee. It will be one of their chocolate flavors though because it's coffee after all. I'm not gonna stick one of the fruity flavors in there. So that gets me kicked off. Then what happens is I go out for the workout and then I am drinking basically to thirst, but I am also targeting some numbers at times when it's hot enough and I know what my sweat loss is. But generally speaking, for every liter of fluid I'm taking in, I'm matching that with 614 milligrams of electrolytes to make sure I'm staying on top of that and remaining hydrated throughout that training session. If you're interested in a deep dive and figuring out more about your fluid loss and electrolyte needs, I actually have a couple podcast episodes that might be interesting to you. One is episode 358 with Andy Blow, where I go over all things hydration. And he talks about how I came up with that 614 milligram loss number and how you can maybe find out about yours as well as how much fluid you are losing with some simple at-home tests. Also, I did an episode a while back, episode 300, which is just titled Personalizing Workout Hydration. So check out both of those if you're interested in doing a deep dive into your hydration and electrolyte needs. Something new I added to my training and racing this year are exogenous ketones. The research for exogenous ketones is still in its early stages, but there is a lot coming out and it is getting more convincing in my opinion to the degree where I wanted to try it out. I actually stress tested it during a 15 hour 100 mile run at the Rocky Raccoon 100 earlier this year as a way to confirm whether it was something I was going to include in my racing protocol. One thing I was a little nervous about with exogenous ketones, like I am with anything I'm ingesting during an ultra marathon, is what is it going to do to digestion. I was interested in the recovery research for some time now with exogenous ketones, and there are some newer research studies now that suggest it could also have some performance applications as well, if you're able to tolerate it and get it in the right dose. So when I decided to try it out, I went with Delta G ketones because they are the ketone ester that basically all the research that has promising effects 
is tied to and it's their formula that's being used in those research studies. So a lot of times you'll just go and look for an exogenous ketone and there's all sorts of potential issues with that, whether it's a dosage or just an incorrect type and it's not actually going to do what the research suggests it would do. So to me, it was looking at if I want to potentially get the benefits that these could be bringing, I need to be using the one that they're actually showing the research with. So that was Delta G ketones. They actually received the DARPA funding and grant to actually put together that formula. So like I said in the, the intro message, they have 50 plus published studies and are part of 20 plus ongoing studies. My protocol with this right now, and this is something where I am evolving as I kind of do more with it, but at the moment, I'll do a bottle of their ketone performance, Delta G performance, and that is their little blue bottle. So I'll take one of those about 20 minutes before a big key training session, and that's it. If it's a race day though, I'll do that same protocol, but I will take another bottle about every three hours after that. So if I'm doing something that's longer duration, like that 15 hour Rocky Raccoon effort I just described, I would be doing that again at three, six, nine, and 12 during that particular performance. So like I said in the intro, if you want to chat with one of their experts, you can actually go to deltagketones.com and they have a consultation service there right now where they will help you understand the research and whether your lifestyle is even something that they would, they would be worth considering it for. So if you wanna get a little more information on that, that option is available to you. Links to both Delta G ketones and Element Electrolytes can be found in the show notes as well as at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 